Hey folks, it's Grimwit from Natch Evil. I'm running the Goon Cup 7 bonus track. And, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit more about Anlo, the world in which I am writing a Nano Remo story. And while doing that, I figured I'd run this track a couple of times, uh, literally twice, because this is a really, really long track. Also, having run it so many times, it's very strange to have fraps running at the same time now. I don't know why. It does something to the frame rate, makes driving this very odd feeling. So, I'm gonna do terrible in this track. Awesome. Now I know. So, um, okay. The last question I was trying to figure out how you define magic in the world of Anilo, which. You know, there are many different ways that you can call magic magic, and uh, I think, was it Orson Scott Card who said that magic is technology that is sufficiently advanced from our own? Uh, I don't think this counts. This is more of a philosophical approach to magic. So, okay, magic is the manipulation of reality. That is what we're going to call this. It is not the manipulation of elements within reality, which is what technology would be. And so we have a stark difference between the two. So you can have... Whoa! That was neat. So you can have steampunk in this area of uh, uh, Anilo. Uh, right now, in the world, it is 2000 ADZ. It's actually 2007 ADZ in the story I'm writing. It takes place about seven years after the first one, which was 2000 ADZ. The prophecy was that in 2000, uh, all the firsts would come. It would be the uh, century of firsts, where everything starts to change. Um, in any case, so reality. How does one manipulate reality? So, okay, all of reality is kind of like a system of progressive patterns. The progression of patterns is time, alright? It's just one of the ways that the spreadsheet spreads out, is just time in general. But we're not going to talk about time. I want to talk about the three easiest forms of magic. Marf magic, or earth magic, earth magic done by the Marfs. Um, Efi magic, even though very few Efis can do magic, there are only five living that can actually do it. One of which is the protagonist of the first story, there we go. <laughs> which is, um, actually it's just called Anilo. And it's also, also going to be the first one I revise and possibly rewrite. And... The third magic is Bork magic. Fire magic. So let's do uh, Earth, Fire, and Warp magic, which is Efi magic. There we go. Okay, so if reality is the manip- or if reality is a system of patterns, then magic is manipulating those patterns. It's the best way to think about it of uh, going into the script and changing or m moving the symbols around, as it were, because of the two rules of magic, of all magic, which is you have to touch in order to manipulate, you have to touch in order to cast magic, and you have to, uh, you have to be able to take whatever's given and vice versa, which basically means that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction when it comes to magic. Okay, easiest one to grab hold of is Earth Magic, which is done by the Marfs, or the Molkin. Uh, Marfs are kind of like a go cross between dwarves and goblins, it's the only way I could quite explain how they look. They're not vicious creatures. They're actually pretty practical thinking creatures, but visual aesthetics, like there's no such thing as Marf cosmetics. Eh? They're, they're pretty ugly creatures. Whee! So... What, what, 
lap am I in? Oh, this is the third lap, okay. <laughs> Concentration? What's that? There must be some kind of camp I can go to learn that, right? Anyway. Um, okay. Manipulation of Earth. Well, what is Earth made of? To the Marfs, Earth is made of everything. So it is the manipulation of any solid or not solid objects. Eventually, you start figuring out how to manipulate liquid objects and then gaseous objects. All of which, as long as you can touch it, counts. Which makes touching gases really fun. And they can start making, like, solid oxygen or solid nitrogen. And yes, they do know what elements are. They have to, because they can see. The very first, uh... The very first thing an apprentice magician does in this world, depending on what kind of magic they're doing, is be able to detect their particular realm of magic. The Marfs understand solid objects, well, just the way that matter works in general better than anyone else. Now, you would think that the life mages, the dryads, would be the people who are who make the best doctors, and they make they do make good doctors, but Marfs make the best surgeons. They are the best physicians, because it is the physical realm in which they live. So they can actually knit skin together and take care of organs and so forth. Uh, this is a really important job in the city of Anilo, where most of the story takes place. Uh, in Anilo, life is, whoa, over sacred. Uh, as in, life is more important than anything. Um, there's still slavery in, in this city. But it's one of the few cities that allows slavery, but... They'll be damned if anybody dies. They would prefer... Banishment, or even, in extreme cases, dismemberment. But not death. Death is the worst. So, Marf physicians are pretty prized. Uh, considering that Anilo pretty much sits on a Marf complex, like, uh, they, they prefer their cities underground. Ah, shit. They prefer their cities underground so that they can manipulate their surroundings better. If you like matter, then you do Okay, okay, let me get back to magic. Let me get back to magic. All right, um, so Earth magic, the manipulation of physical objects. Pretty cool. Um, you can control the solidness of it. You can control the properties of what makes matter matter. Uh, for example, let's say you take a bit of earth, like this mud that i am got my car in right now. I love rally racing. Uh, they could compact it, make it solid. Um, they would have to basically push it together. Um, the rule that which is given is taken away kind of applies when you're just pushing matter closer together because you're also taking away from the air around it. It's kind of... It's hard to think about because so much of it you kind of take for granted. Um, Whenever you reduce the volume of something, but increase its density, you are at the same time, on a very minute level with the air around you, increasing the volume of the air, and reducing its density. So, the rules still apply, the uh, laws of opposites, I guess. Uh, for every magical action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, so... If you want to do something, however, like, let's say you want to take a piece of plastic. I'm going to assume for the for this hypothetical that there is such a thing as plastic. They don't have that technology yet. Um, if you want to make plastic as hard as steel, then you would have to take some steel and make it as weak as plastic. That which is taken is given and vice versa. So gonna have to mute that part. So, alright. A pretty simple concept. If you take two physical objects, you can kind of 
either mush them together, internet, uh, intertwine them, or um, change their properties around. So, so far, so good. Energy is a little bit harder to understand. The Borks are masters of fire magic, uh, and all energy is within their realms of uh, fire magic. They just use fire as an example because it's the, it's the easiest to understand. Who doesn't need fire, you know? Hell, even the Marfs need fire. So, uh, actual raw energy is, by its very nature, it follows the second rule of magic pretty cleanly. That which is given is taken away, so all you have to remember is wherever you can draw energy from, you can create energy. Speaking of fire magic, orcs like throwing fireballs. They're very much fire kin, even though they're, they're bear kin. But they're like fire bears. What's cooler than that? Uh, in any case, um, what they'll do is they'll take heat, which to them is the simplest form of energy, the simplest form of fire, is heat. They can take heat from around them and store it in them, in their gut. And then whenever they need to release heat, they fucking throw it. Uh, they can, however, channel heat. Uh, Borks are expert channelers of any kind of energy. Later on, when a Bork gets really clever, he can start to channel energy through other items other than himself. As long as he's touching it, he's fine. Which is why, if you see a Bork with a whip, Avoid, especially if that whip's made of metal. Because now we're talking electricity, which is just heat in super advanced form to them. A uh, great example are the lightning benders from Avatar, the airbender. That's, that's what we're talking about here, is that, that kind of level. But, see, there are different, more advanced forms of energy that you can play with. Woo! 12 minutes, 14 seconds. That was terrible. But I've got, like, another five weeks to make this track faster. My best time is... Oh, I know I've done better than that. I know I've done better than that. Give me a second. Here it is. Uh, 12 minutes, 3 seconds. Yeah, I can do better than that. Alright, let's start again. <coughs> Alright. So, um... The transference of heat is follows the second rule perfectly well. So what you're left with is the first rule that the Bork have to overcome. Uh, you can only touch things to affect things. Touch is necessary for magic to happen. How do you throw a fireball? Which is basically the trick. The reason why Borks are so good at conquering things is because they can just destroy walls and get together and make these gigantic ballistas of fire, and it's kind of like a KISS show, actually, like a KISS concert. <laughs> like, holy hell, Borks! Real fun to watch their sieges. Um. Okay, so we want to throw a fireball. Uh, interesting mental exercise. You need to be able to set something on fire. Alright. Well, that's easy enough. You can just have, like, a piece of paper or something. Hmm. The amount of energy you channel into the paper... Well, I guess that would consume the paper really fast and go up in a flash. But what about the rest of that energy? I guess that would make an explosion in their hand, which... This is an interesting exercise. I hadn't actually thought about it. Okay... If you just want to make fire erupt from your palms, that would be easy for a Bork. No problem. Just bounce off the wall there. But what if you want Nasha to throw a fireball? If you were a Marf, 
it would be easy, but Marfs can't do fire magic. <laughs> huh. I gotta think about that one. Whoa, whoa! Just bounce off the walls and everywhere. It's fun to think about these philosophy problems or these little troubles. Oh man, how do you throw a fireball? Ah, if you can control the energy, then maybe you can make the energy into its own thing. So fireballs would actually be a pretty advanced, a pretty advanced technique. I mean, just flamethrower out your hands is easy enough as drawing of drawing the heat from your feet, right? From just the ground around you. Then uh, channeling all of that heat out through your hand. A fireball, I guess you would have to take the energy and compress it in such a way that the energy holds itself back. Like a bomb. Only made out of fire. So, think of it like this. You have a ball, and the outside of the ball is fire that is imploding. It's pointing into itself, into a sphere of itself. That makes the wall that you're holding all the rest of the energy with. So, a fireball is fire that's both imploding and exploding at the same time. And then whatever, whenever it hits whatever it hits, the wall of imploding fire breaks, letting the exploding fire out. Oh man, that's so fucking cool. That is so fucking cool. Ah. Uh, this, this is why I like playing with magic and why I like doing these overcomplicated things is figuring out the physics of how magic works and why one of the reasons why I decided to make the world like this. That's, that is just awesome! Alright, alright. So, like I said, a KISS concert. <laughs> Explosions?! <coughs> Every time I cross that place, I cough. What the hell? So, alright. Um, I think... I think... Fire magic is pretty much self-explained, so that's earth and fire. Now let's get to something a little harder to explain, and explain also why there are only five, five Efi that can do uh, warp magic. Uh, Efi, first off, Efi have one hell of a crazy kind of situation on their hands. Um, there we go. The if you are mostly stupid, they're just really stupid creatures. It's not really their fault. They're trained to be stupid. Uh, the world does not work in the same way that everybody else sees it for an Ify. So, just, just in general, Ify's can see in five-dimensional space. That's a kind of a good way to see it. They can basically look at the inside of space on the outside of space. But they don't know they can do it. And since nobody else can see space like that, they dedicate an awful lot of brain power to understand the world how everybody else does. And it makes them stupid. And a smart Efi, one that just is as intelligent as a normal person is a dangerous thing because they can do warp magic on their own and the church of mandra doesn't want that and the ixar people which is oh god their own kind of crazy i'll get to them eventually uh don't want that both both of the moons the Moom race and the Ixar race tried to keep the Ify stupid for opposing reasons. Um, Mooms and Ixars do not, they, they are not friends. They are never friends. If an Ixar acts like a Moom is a friend, it's because they want something. 
And most moons, not all of them, most moons know that. So, alright. Ify Warp Magic. I stole this completely from Mage the Ascension. I haven't played the other Mage games, I've only played Mage the Ascension. And Ify Magic is, course, is the Sphere of Correspondence. Everything in the universe exists in one point in space at one time. So we're messing with patterns of spatial placement. So, an Ify, who is good at warp magic, realizes that there is no such thing as distance. It's just a line on a page. It's just a pattern. It's just instructions. A, a location value in a computer. It's nothing. There's no such thing as distance. There's no spoon, as it were. Whee! This is what makes Ephes dangerous. Because what is the first rule of magic in Anla? If you can touch it, you can manipulate it. Ephes, when they got their shit down and they can see properly, because the first thing you can do in magic is kind of detect and notice and and uh, appreciate how that particular f form of patterns works, Ephes can see inside people. And if they want, they can punch your heart from the outside of you, from, like, the other side of the Earth. So what is that like? What is it like to look at the world and see this pattern of spatial differences? First off, Size doesn't matter. How tall you are is just part of a spatial pattern. So you can be as large as you want. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have all the mass that you want or all the power that you can have. But how big you are, I mean, you can just change that value. And you're touching yourself all the time. You are part of yourself. So you can just change your own size on will. Why not? Secondly, distance means nothing. Um, the better an Ify gets at seeing space, the more they realize that there is no distance to see it with. They can see everything at once. They can't understand everything at once. I mean, if you're looking at a huge complicated picture, say like a map of the city, you can't understand all the road systems at once, you still have to kind of follow the roads to see where you need to go. It's the same way with being an Ify. You can see it all, but you can't understand it all. You have to focus on one thing at a time. So if they're searching for somebody, they still have to search. They still have to look through and see where that particular person is. And considering that they see all of 3D space in front of them as one thing, that's a pretty large place, so there's, they're not going to just instantly see someone. And that, again, is like pattern recognition. Like, how do you know that particular person you see is the person you're looking for, unless you look up real close to them? So, focus is still an issue. Whee! Finally, just movement. So what? It's, it's just changing the value of where you are. Hell, you can move other people, and you you can touch them. Why not? They're there in front of you. Space doesn't mean anything. So if you want to teleport someone to where you are, all you're really doing is, as an Ify is grabbing them and pulling them to the spatial coordinates of where you want them. This makes Ephes dangerous, which is why there are only five Ephes who can do this. Uh, a couple of them are mistakes. Two of them are not. So let me see here. I can only account for three of them right now. The other two I haven't done anything with. They're not vicious creatures, fortunately. The protagonist of the first book is Quill. 
uh, not to be related with Quill 18. And she has definitely this kind of slave mentality. Boom, there we go. Uh, most of them do, two of them don't. Uh, that's because of the society of the Efi race and how they work. You know what, though? I'll just save that for another day when I'm not talking about magic, because I just covered three types of magic in ten laps, and I think I think this is a good stopping point. Um, mostly, this is just to kind of get it out so that people can see it, enjoy if you like thinking about these things. Leave comments of what you think. Discussion helps me think about how this world works and how magic works. The big one is time. Time is still a big one to figure out. Time and mind magic. Or time and, and heart magic, soul magic. Both of those things are really complex subjects. And I got them on the top tier of understanding how magic works. I don't even understand how they really work. So, alright. You guys, enjoy yourselves. Thanks for listening to me ramble. I'll talk to you later.